Hey folks, Rob with Two Guys in a Ride. And today we're gonna to take a look and hear a cool story about this 1931 Model A two-door. But before we do, take a moment, hit that subscribe button down below and ring that bell notification up top so you never miss one of these videos. Uh, my name is Mitch Peterson. Uh, this is actually my grandpa's 1931 Model A. So tell us a little bit about you and then tell us a little bit about the car that we see right out the window there. Well, the car you see out the window, I bought from a guy in Rochester, Minnesota in 1972. And I went down, I had been down to Rochester and I was looking for old cars and I bought another 26 Model T Ford and I went down to pick that up. And then I found out about this 1931 Model A that a guy had restored and had it in his garage and he wanted the garage space so he put it up for sale. And I looked at it and, and ended up buying it. In 1972 I paid $900 for it and it was all like you see it today. Uh, he'd restored it, and it really run good and does today. And, and and you used to use this then up until how many years ago? You you used it quite often as a daily driver. Well, among yeah, other vehicles. Yeah, I uh, at one time I had 13 old cars, which you will see on my auction bill. I was a manager of a farm supply. Uh, called Midland Cooperatives, okay. and I restored the, the old truck that delivered the first gallon of gas that Midland ever sold, wow. and, uh, and today that truck is in the museum down in Waseca, Minnesota. Really? But I've always been uh, an old car fan, and uh, uh, boats and motors and stuff that I bought since my brother, two older brothers and I bought a, a first car when I was 12 years old. I've always been a tinkerer. And, and another thing about like on, on the Model A you've got here and even to the Model T, we've got to put ourselves back in time and look at all the things that have happened in the world since those vehicles were produced. It's amazing that a lot of these vehicles are even still around mm -hmm. with uh, world wars, different things of uh, that you had rationing, that people were taking vehicles that were 10, 15 years old, they lived their life, they were done, they would scrap them out yeah. for the war effort, for different things like that, just for money, or they would be out in a grove somewhere completely rusted apart. So to see that you had accumulated the number of cars that you did, and that you took care of them still. Mm -hmm. And you you pick and choose one and another on different times to make it your weekly or daily driver. That's uh, that's really that's really cool to, to think that, that people are interested in preserving that piece of history like that. That was my hobby. Yeah, my grandpa kind of plays it off a little bit too, that yeah, I just liked collecting cars and stuff, but he's almost a curator in my eyes. He, he had a, a working museum in the, the city of Sacred Heart where most people just saw kind of a rundown building, but me and my brother Brian kind of grew up wrenching on stuff in there the entire time. So he, he's pretty modest about it, but he is probably the reason why a lot of these cars made it through portions of that era and things like that just by because they could have sat in that like that 27T you talked about it could have just sat in the barn in pristine condition until it wasn't anymore but he took it on took care of it used it that's the most important thing is driving the things down the road so they actually stay functioning uh, I done quite a bit of traveling and I'd go to a meeting or something mm -hmm. And or uh, like uh, the one Model T that I found, I just in the gas station companies that I managed, we had a tire changer, mm -hmm. and 
I bought a new model tire changer and I advertised my old one. Well, the, the guy in the town down by Minneapolis uh, bought my tire changer and I delivered it down there. And I'd always, when I'd go somewhere, I'd ask, like if I was talking to you, I'd say, do you know where there's any old antique cars? Mm. And I was in this town down by the cities and I asked this guy in the station, I said, you don't happen to know of any old antique cars that's for sale? And he, he said, well, I know one is for sale. He said, 1927 Model T Ford. And I said, well, do you mind giving me the, tell me where it is? And mm -hmm. he said, no, and he told me about it. I drove out there and drove up in the yard and this old couple came out and I said, I understand you got a 27 Model T Ford that you'd like to sell. And his wife spoke up and she said, yeah, I want to get rid of it. She said, he <laughs> makes me sit in the back seat in parades. And I don't like that. And I'd like, I wish he'd get But that's where of. the royalty sits, in the back seat. Yeah. The driver sits and up front. So we went down. He said, it's in the shed down there. He said... We went down there and he opened up the doors. Here was this 1927 Model T two-door, perfect. Just wow. like it was, just came out of the factory. And mm -hmm. I said, uh, how much do you want for it? He said, $750. Yeah. I took my checkbook out and wrote <laughs> him a check. Just wow. like that, within a few minutes. No discussion, you uh, knew it was worth it and you yeah, knew you wanted to have it. And his wife was standing back there. She couldn't believe that he that I'd bought it. Wow. And he said to me, he said, I've had several people looking at it. He said, and I told them I wanted seven hundred and fifty dollars. They just laughed at me. And he said, I told you, and you took the checkbook out and wrote me out a check. He's probably thinking he should have asked you for eight hundred. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, How come you bought it? Well, I said it's worth every penny right. that I paid you. Yep. I yep. said otherwise <laughs> I wouldn't have bought it. That was one thing I always wished when I was a kid mm -hmm. that I could afford to have a Continental. Sure. And I ended up, I bought my wife a new one and I bought a new one, four door in 68. <laughs> We'd been to the doctor's appointment in Minneapolis, and we was on the way home, and we stopped in the Ford dealer in Minneapolis, and they had a, a Lincoln Continental Coupe on display there, and we looked at that, and the dealer said he couldn't sell it because it was his show car okay. for the year. And so we came um, driving through Hutchinson and here was a big semi unloading Lincoln Continentals for the Ford dealer in Hutchinson. And here was this green uh, two-door coupe, real fancy car. And I, we tried to buy it and he said he couldn't sell it because that was his show car, but he put my name on the list. Okay. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I get a telephone call and he said, well, that car is for sale now. If you're interested, come on down. So I went down there and we bought that uh, okay. 60, 68, wasn't it, I think. Yeah. Uh, and that was her car. That, that, was, her, her that was her baby. She always wanted the coupe instead of the four-door. So uh, getting back to our Model A here, what are some of your most favorite times that you remember with this uh, particular car? Oh, taking my, giving my grandkids rides and stuff in, in the car. Okay. I had uh, the... Uh, were, were, they, were they little hellions or did they actually appreciate what, that, well, what it was or they just didn't know it they yet? They would laugh and sing and have high old time. Is that right? Well, it's one of the first cars that I uh, learned how to drive a manual transmission. Grew up on a farm. So, um, growing up with the things, it's, you know, just 
going for cruises with grandpa and my dad and having three generations in one car. And the other thing is too, just uh, like I said before, I love when I pull up, you know, I think grandpa said he paid $900 or $700 or something like that for this thing. Um, I'm a car guy through and through. I show up to these car shows and you see some of these $100,000 Challenger Resto mods and Charger Resto mods and you know old cars and stuff like that. I beat the Luga horn on this thing once and I've got more people standing around it than any of those cars. I absolutely love that about this thing. No matter where you drive it, you're always turning heads. People are laughing and smiling at you. A lot of people, they use a car as a, as a utility piece, which it is. It gets you from point A to point B and it gets you there in modern days warm and dry and fast and comfortable. I mean, you've got massaging seats and everything else. but. It's just the kindred spirit that car guys have, that we all have, mm -hmm. that no matter what our job is, how much money we have or have made in our life, uh, young, old, white, black, male, female, doesn't matter. We all come around to one thing that we all just really appreciate cars for the pure aspect that there's something that can you can create a lot of memories around. Mm -hmm something that you can pass on from generation to generation like you've done here and and that you can go back and relive a lot of those cool memories so how does it make you feel that you've turned these two grandkids into car guys also well i'm very proud of <laughs> glad that, i love it i glad love that it it'll stay in the family and yeah well okay so now how did you come about obtaining this car then if it's your granddad's uh, well, my a few years back, my grandma actually fell ill. My grandpa had quite the car collection. Uh, he actually, he's still with us, but he, me and my brother and my one cousin inherited this from him and decided to become the caretakers of it to make sure it stays just the way he always wanted it to be. But that's the reason why out of all my grandpa's collection, we chose this one because literally me and my brother came in here and dumped a gallon of gas into it. He charged the battery over the weekend, put air in the tires, and within 30 seconds, we had it running, driving right out of the garage for the first time this season. There was no, we haven't touched it since last year. But. Yeah. And then just, uh, it was one of the ones too where um, my grandpa was always a firm believer on just fixing everything yourself. So no, this isn't a pristine show car. No, it's not the original color, but it's grandpa's car. So uh, it's gonna stay green and yellow probably till we pass it on to the next generation as it is. Uh, he always wanted something so that we can enjoy it, drive it around and just not have it be a showpiece. Uh, we want to be able just to cruise into town with it, take it down the gravel road and go for a cruise. Now you've got about 11 years or so and this, this piece of rolling art, this car is going to be 100 years old. That's amazing and I, I shared this with you earlier. To think maybe when uh, the men were working on the assembly line to imagine if they could have that uh, what they were building that day would still one of those vehicles would still be around uh, you know 90 years 100 years later that's just uh, it's, it's almost inconceivable to think that but it's really cool that it is and too like I was saying earlier too that to think of the wars and the rationing and uh, the metal that was needed, the rubber that was needed, the wood that was needed, all those things that people scrapped vehicles out for uh, in the past 80, 90 years, but this thing still survives. That's really cool about it. Yeah. Well, then what, what do you hope to do with it? You were telling, sharing with me a little bit, what do you hope to do with it in a couple of years when she turns 100? So she? I'm, is it she, I guess? Sure. Yeah? Christmas is there a name? No name. I, I, do you have a name for it? No. no, wait a minute. 100 years old and she doesn't have a name. Come on. Okay, maybe for the 100th birthday you can give her a name. We'll, we'll christen it, maybe. But yeah. uh, no, the biggest thing is we just want to keep it exactly how old Grandpa had it for its little quirks and imperfections and things like that because yep. it's kind of a... It's just how we're going to remember them probably for the rest of our lives too as well. Um, but after, once it rolls over 100, I want to actually take a serious look. I want to keep it exactly the way it is, but I'd like to have it a little bit more road where they maybe go. It has never had bearings, bottom end, top end, nothing's ever been done to this except for uh, he updated it, put an updated distributor in it, it still kept it 6 volt, made it a little easier for us to start. Uh, also by upgrading to electronic or electrical uh, start on the thing too as well. So we'd have to crank start it every single time. Right. Uh, just made it a little more user friendly. So wait a minute, you're telling me that as far as you know, the engine's never been apart? Correct. Oh my and gosh. And the, he, 
He said the speedometer worked when he got it, but the mileage, it's clicked up to, I think, 30... 32 is 32, what it looked 000. like earlier, yeah. yeah. And, Do you know if that's 32 or 132 or you don't have no we, idea? We have no idea because that was back before I was even born, that clicked 32 and it decided to stop. So it's little things like that <laughs> I'd like to... Correct, so you know the function is 100%. The, we do have headlights on it. I maybe would like to convert it to a 12 volt system just for simplicity. It is a right. six volt system. Right. Uh, actually put blinkers in taillights. People don't realize that there's one taillight on here that yep. doesn't work. Uh, but just, just for a little more drivability and yep. peace of mind when, as you are driving it, a little bit of safety. Yep. Well, and you know, I mean, we've got the story with your granddad uh, as well uh, that w to, as part of this video. And it's really cool to see that he was a caretaker of this, but uh, you got to give yourself a little credit too because uh, you've uh, obligated yourself to taking care of this vehicle and then I'm sure it'll get passed down to continue to stay in the family. And, and that's just so cool because, um, you know, you, there's probably parts out there you could probably rebuild one, but it's never going to be like this. No. Nope, this is original. Uh, this is as it was built. Now, obviously, you know, you've changed colors and stuff like that, yeah. but by and large, this is what would have come off of the line, and it just still blows me away that it's in existence to this day. Yeah. So overall, then, let me ask you this. Your most favorite car that you've ever had? And I know that's going to be tough, but... No. Oh? Well, I was really proud of my two Lincolns that we okay. had, because that was... From the time I was a little kid, I always had linkage cars on my mind, mm -hmm. but the, the old 1919 Model T was really the, my favorite car, and always has been, and okay. I've been sorry ever since I sold it, Right. but it was storage room and all that, right. you know, I had to get rid of stuff. And right. So... But well, at least you kept one one um, member, existential member of the family. It's still around, and it sounds like with uh, with uh, both of you guys, you're going to keep it around for many, many years to come. So if you had one thing to tell our viewers about your life and uh, the memories that you've had and all the tinkerings of things that you've made and created and, and uh, the cars you've driven and the family you've had, what uh, kind of give us some uh, s summarize your most favorite memories that you've had, family, life, business, you name it. I, I'll never forget, and I don't think my girls and my family will ever forget our camping and the life at the lake home, and that was my number one that I'll never forget. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for sharing some memories with us today, telling us about you and telling us about your uh, your cool car collection. So, Sid, thank you so much. You Appreciate know, I'm it. I'm so proud to be able to do it. So, Well, Mitch, thank you so much for sharing today. Thanks for allowing us the opportunity to meet your granddad as well and to hear his story. And uh, that's, that's just it. It's an awesome car. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.